It's getting dark really fast. Australia sends their military to enforce COVID lockdowns in Sydney. Not quite martial law, but what's happening is the suspension of civilian law for special law to be enforced by the military, which fits the definition of martial law, though there is no military commander assuming control and the ability to create and enforce law. So it is not legally on the books martial law, but it gets pretty close only by technicality, I suppose. And the question is, for many people, will we face mandatory vaccination and will we face lockdowns in the United States? And I think the answer is a resounding yes. Jack Posobiec tweeted that according to a source in the White House, there is chatter that within the next couple of weeks, there will be lockdowns. At least the blue states seem to be in line. We'll go over his tweet. Now, it's not a confirmation. Perhaps White House scuttlebutt, perhaps coloring of the water, meaning the information may not be true. I don't know for sure. What I, do know is, what I do know is that Joe Biden has not ruled it out. Joe Biden has not ruled out whether or not the DOJ can force people to take the vaccine, period. He was asked and he said he didn't know. Now, there is some pushback from the White House saying that they don't want to go this route and they're trying to avoid this. And uh, yeah, maybe or maybe they're trying to avoid a panic. You know, we knew things were bad in Australia, but sending in the military to enforce their lockdowns and why? Well, they said that some people felt the rules didn't apply to them. Sure, but couldn't the police get involved? Or perhaps it was the police who were the ones saying they wouldn't enforce this, which brings, which brings me back to the U.S. There have been numerous sheriff's, department who have said, sheriff's departments who have said they're not going to enforce this stuff. With the Delta variant spreading, with the big tech censorship and the sporadic news, different stories popping up in and out that seem to contradict each other, it really does seem like we are headed for some kind of major crisis, which will likely take the form of lockdowns and some kind of authoritarian rule. And we're also look, staring on the face of the eviction crisis, which is looming in just about one day. That's right. The moratorium on evictions will be ending, and this will result in millions of people getting the boot. New York apparently has a plan. They're going to pay the landlords. And now Nancy Pelosi has come out saying we need an emergency extension of the eviction, uh, I'm sorry, of the moratorium on evictions. There's also been calls to extend the COVID unemployment benefits. While they're talking about locking down this country and forcing people to get vaccines and uh, locking down restaurants, Nevada has been locked down. D.C. has reintroduced, uh, I'm sorry, Nevada has reintroduced mask mandates. D.C. is reintroducing mask mandates. California, of course. While all that is happening, the southern border is completely porous and about 1.2 million people have already crossed the border and been arrested this year alone. They're locking down the country in a variety of ways. Not as bad yet, but it could be serious in two weeks. Meanwhile, they're opening up, figuratively, the southern border. You know, I was talking to some friends and I said, this is the, the erosion and the collapse. You know, call it whatever you want. But if you have people bringing in non-citizens, not testing them for COVID, many of them have COVID. We're seeing Border Patrol agents get COVID. They're being ferried and shipped around the U.S. In fact, one whistleblower says the Biden admin was actually trafficking children. Yet at the same time, they're enforcing extreme laws on, the, on regular people. It's a narco tyranny. And I don't know what else to say. You know, there, there are some questions and concerns about what's happening to this planet for sure. But I wonder if there's actually any evidence to justify the extremism that we're seeing. And we've seen throughout history the attempts by authoritarians to seize control. And it seems like authoritarians have certainly seized control this time. Only they're typically wrong. I don't know who's right. I can only tell you it's going to get, well, I would assume it's going to get worse. Before we get started, head over to TimCast.com. Become a member to help support our fierce and independent journalism. And you will get an ad-free experience and access to the members-only podcasts from TimCast IRL. These occur after the show, and uh, you're really helping us expand our operation. We'll see how long that lasts. You know, Dave Rubin just got suspended on Twitter for 12 hours. I can only imagine they're coming for us. A uh, big tech censorship, I mean, and um, we'll do the best we can while we can. Let's read the news and see exactly what's going on. But before we do, like, uh, hit, the, hit the like button, subscribe to this channel, and share the show with your friends. From TimCast.com, Australia sends their military to enforce coronavirus lockdowns in Sydney. The Australian military will now be working with local police to enforce coronavirus lockdowns and restrictions in Sydney, including knocking on residents' doors to make sure they are complying. 
On Monday, approximately 300 soldiers will begin patrolling the city of 6 million, which is under strict lockdown orders until August 28th. NPR reports that the military's help is needed to enforce the restrictions because a small minority of people thought, quote, the rules didn't apply to them. New South Wales Police Minister David Elliott told Australia's Channel 9, quote, Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison has come in, in for heavy criticism in recent weeks over the slow pace of vaccinations in Australia, where about 14 percent have been fully dosed, one of the poorest records among any member country of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the report explains. Will, a resident in Bankstown, told The Guardian that the military deployment was just a continuation of the heavy handed approach to enforcement in the region, quote, it's a sign of, of a continuation of the militarized and policed response to this entire outbreak. It continues the way Western Sydney is policed, the way movement and recreation is policed. But at the same time, it amplifies it, it uh, and marginalizes people. It just makes it worse. Quote, their deployment is such a statement about the nature of the problem. And the problem is us, the people who live in Western Sydney. They're saying the problem isn't the vaccine rollout or their failure to support uh, support people. The problem is our compliance. The resident described the troop rollout as an invasion and said that he believes that it will increase skepticism among those who are not vaccinated. Quote, I can't think of anything that will lend more credence to conspiracy theories than this. The concerned resident added, I can't think of anything. They've been talking about martial law for so long, and now it's confirmed. I always say this. You're going to hear me say it 50 million times on the podcast. Please don't get medical advice from news articles or from me. I can talk about news. My opinions are not professional expert medical opinions. You need doctors for that. Whether you, whether you like your doctor or not, find one you trust. The U.S. government describes martial law as the temporary substitution of military authority for civilian rule and is usually invoked in time of war, rebellion, or natural disaster. Though what is happening in Sydney sounds very similar to what one would expect to see under martial law and the general description and the general description, it is not unless a military commander takes over authority to make and enforce laws. At least that's according to the U.S. government. I'm sure there are some interpretations of martial law as just the military being called in to enforce the law. I'm sure some people will call this martial law and there'll be an argument over definitions, which I don't think are particularly relevant. But for the sake of clarifying and making sure everybody knows what's happening, we'll just say Australia has deployed its military to enforce COVID lockdowns. Morrison has responded to outrage over the heavy handed lockdowns by urging people to get vaccinated if they want their freedom back. Quote, if you get vaccinated, there will be special rules that apply to you. Why? Because if you're vaccinated, you present less of a public health risk. You are less likely to get the virus. You are less likely to, to transmit it. The prime minister told reporters on Friday, according to the Sydney Morning Herald, only that information, I believe, is being contradicted by the Washington Post right now. Now, I'll have more information on that specifically in the next portion of the, of the podcast. For those who are watching my videos, that was actually on my, my other YouTube channel. But Dave Rubin talks a bit about this, and I believe that may not be correct. Go read the Washington Post. Here's an article from the U.S. Department of Justice Office of Justice Programs, Martial Law in Times of Civil Disorder. Annotation. Martial law involves the temporary substitution of military authority for civilian rule and is usually invoked in a time of war, rebellion or natural disaster. Suffice it to say, civilians are still in control in Sydney. It is not a military commander who has come in and assumed control. So this is not, at least according to this, uh, um, this, this, this uh, article from the Department of Justice, it is not necessarily government defined martial law. They write, when martial law is in effect, the military commander of an area uh, or country has unlimited authority to make and enforce laws. Martial law is justified when civilian authority has ceased to function, is completely absent, or has become ineffective. Further, martial law suspends all existing laws, as well as civil authority and the ordinary administration of justice. In the U.S., martial law may be declared by proclamation of the president or a state governor, but such a formal proclamation is not necessary. Although the U.S. Constitution makes no specific provision for the imposition of martial law, nearly every state has a constitutional provision authorizing the government to impose martial law. The power of martial law, once held to be nearly absolute, has limitations. For example, civilians may not be tried by military tribunals as long as civilian courts are functional. Nonetheless, within the bounds of court decisions, a military commander's authority under martial law is virtually unlimited. Martial law has been declared nine times since World War II. 
and in five instances was designed to counter resistance to federal uh, desegregation decrees in the South. Although a climate of mutual aid has always existed between the military and civilian law enforcement and should continue to exist, Department of Defense personnel are limited in what they can do to enforce civil law. Military personnel cannot be used in surveillance or undercover operations, and they may not be used as informants, investigators, or interrogators unless the investigation is a joint military-civilian operation in which the military has an interest in the case's outcome. Now, this is an article from 1989. It is fairly out of date. And again, as I stated, it's just one thing we pulled up from .gov, giving us an idea of what martial law is. I think we are close to whatever martial law is here in the United States, but we'll see. Jack Posobiec tweets, White House chatter is that lockdowns for Delta variant all but a done deal. Virtually all blue states are cooperating with White House and the CDC. They're aiming for late second week of August per White House official. So we will see. It is not confirmed. It is White House chatter. For all we know, things change. Jack does have sources in the White House and has had many of his stories turn out to be accurate. But we'll see. From Yahoo News, publishing the National Review, Biden admin not ruling out further lockdowns if scientists recommend them. I hope you're paying attention because the very least you can you can figure out what you need to do to keep your family safe for the time being when whatever's happening happens. White House Deputy Press Secretary Karen Jean-Pierre on Thursday would not rule out further lockdowns to mitigate the spread of COVID-19 if scientists recommended such action. During a press briefing, Fox News' Peter Ducey noted that President Biden had previously promised that no further lockdowns would be implemented. However, Ducey asked why Americans should trust Biden, given that he had made a similar promise regarding masks, which the CDC began recommending again this week in areas of, of high or substantial spread, even for vaccinated people. Quote, well, because we listen to the scientists, Jean-Pierre said, we listen to the experts. This is a public health situation. This is not about politics at all. This is about saving lives. And this is what the president is all about. He wants to make sure we are saving lives. The deputy press secretary argued that data on the virus from the past six months shows that Biden has saved lives. Now we're at a point where we have to double down and make it very, very clear to people that we can't let the pandemic win, Jean-Pierre said. We have to continue to fight. Ducey then asked if the administration would support additional shutdowns if scientists recommended lockdowns and school closures. Well, like I said, we listen to the CDC and the experts and their guidance. The CDC is a body that is very well respected. So the answer is yes, perhaps. They, they would they would if recommended. And like we saw with masks, masks are coming back. D.C., for instance, mandatory mask mandate, in Nevada, California, likely many other places. From TimCast.com, Biden says, I don't know yet about mandatory vaccines for the whole country. President Joe Biden added to the growing confusion surrounding vaccine mandates during a press briefing from the White House Thursday, telling reporters, I don't know that yet when asked about a federal requirement to receive the injection. Quote, why not push for a vaccine mandate in the states, private companies and schools? Do you want to see those entities pass vaccine mandates? Asked one reporter from Joe Biden. I'd like to see them continue to move in that direction. I asked the Justice Department to determine whether they're able to do that legally, and they can. Local communities can do that. Local businesses can do that. It's still a question whether the federal government can mandate the whole country. I don't know that yet. Well, he's not saying, no, it won't happen. He's saying he just doesn't know yet, and he wants to move in that direction. So please pay attention. We do have a Bill of Rights, but it's only as strong as those willing to stand up for it. Biden's comments come hours after he instructed states to offer $100 incentives to all people receiving the vaccine. Quote, no task is more urgent than turning the tide on the pandemic, and there is no better tool than vaccination, the Treasury Department said in a statement. Treasury stands ready to give technical assistance to state and local governments so that they may use the funds effectively to support increased vaccination in their communities. And Treasury will partner with the Department of Health and Human Services throughout this effort, it said. From the Daily Mail, Delta variant is as infectious as chickenpox or Ebola, and infected vaccinated people transmitted as easily as unvaccinated. CDC document claims, as agency says, data that led to mass U-turn will be released today. OK, so this is the point I was making earlier about what was said in Australia. Let me show you the story. Morrison said, if you get vaccinated, there will be special rules for you. Why? This is a quote, by the way, because if you're vaccinated, you present less of a public health risk. You are less likely to get the virus. You are less likely to transmit it. Now from the CDC, 
Delta variant is as infectious as chickenpox or Ebola, and infected vaccinated people transmit it as easily as unvaccinated. The prime minister, uh, I believe that was the prime minister right in Australia, uh, Morrison, he is incorrect. I don't know what to tell you, my friends. I've got uh, uh, two news sources, right? That's a quote from the prime minister. That's not TimCast.com making that up. That is a quote from the prime minister. It's this, this story has been covered by the BBC, by NPR. And we have the story from the Daily Mail, as well as similar uh, statements made by the Washington Post. So I can't tell you what to or what not to uh, believe. I don't know if, if we can. You know, I think we're facing information overload. The Internet has become static and it's hard to navigate. That's why I think talking to a doctor is the best thing for you. Again, people will say, but their doctor doesn't know. Then you need a better doctor. I'll say that 50 billion times. Sorry, I understand it's a bit repetitive, but it's, it's, it's a genuinely an important point to be made as the media seems to be 100 percent broken. The CDC, uh, I'm sorry, the Daily Mail reports health officials in the U.S. will on Friday explain the science behind their U-turn on face masks as Republicans express skepticism over the decision, which appears to have stemmed from research into a July 4th outbreak. The CDC on Tuesday announced that they were updating their previous guidance to now recommend that vaccinated people wear face masks once more when indoors and in parts of the country with substantial COVID-19 transmission. They did not explain their reason for the shift in policy. In fact, I believe it was even the Washington Post said, what's the data? What's the science? For there was none. This has sparked fevered debate and merely said it was due to new data on the highly contagious Delta variant. On May 13th, the American public was told they no longer needed to wear masks indoors if vaccinated. An internal federal health document obtained by the Washington Post claimed the Delta variant was as infectious as chickenpox or Ebola, with each infected person passing the virus to eight or nine others on average. That infectivity is known as RO. The original lineage was, ab- was about as transmissible as the common cold, with each infected per- person passing it to about two others on average. CDC Dr. Rochelle Walensky has previously noted the rarity of viruses with such high R values, telling CNN. When you think about diseases that have an RO of eight or nine, there aren't that many. Officials, the document stated, must acknowledge the war has changed. The source of the data was unclear, but it appeared to have been provided to the Post and the New York Times at the same time, suggesting the possibility of a coordinated leak. Walensky, director of the CDC, said that the new data to be published on Friday showed that vaccinated people infected with the Delta variant carry tremendous amounts of the virus in the nose and throat. Walensky told the New York Times the data suggests that even fully immunized people can be unwilling vectors for the virus a change from the previously held belief that vaccinated people were unlikely to increase the spread of COVID-19. Walensky privately briefed members of Congress on Thursday, drawing on much of the material in the slide presentation obtained by the Washington Post. Quote, I think people need to understand that we're not crying wolf here. This is serious, she told CNN. One of the slides states that there's a higher risk among older age groups for hospitalization and death relative to younger people, regardless of vaccination status. Really? I'm sorry, man. This, this, this brings up a whole lot of questions that I can't answer. And I don't even know if I'm allowed to read the news this way because the, the new information that's coming out, it's updated and YouTube's rules aren't. I, I, I don't know what to tell you guys. It's becoming impossible for me to figure out what is the latest information and what is happening and what's true. And boy, I'm trying my best and boy, work is tough. But this is getting crazy. I mean, that statement right there flies in the face of everything the left has been saying and yelling at me about and what I accepted to be, the, to be the case. One of the slides states there is a higher risk among older age groups for hospitalization and death relative to younger people, regardless of vaccination status. I don't understand what I'm supposed to say about that. Am I supposed to say that this is fake news, YouTube? Let's just do that. Let's just say, I, I don't know. I, I don't know if any of this is true. I'm just reading the news. How about that? What am I supposed to say? Another estimate, another estimates that there are 35,000 symptomatic infections per week among 162 million vaccinated Americans. The document outlines communication challenges fueled by cases in vaccinated people, including concerns from local health departments about whether coronavirus vaccines remain effective and a public convinc- uh, and a public convinced vaccines no longer work, booster doses needed. Are they now saying that we're going to need boosters? The CDC was criticized this week for updating the mask guidance without de- uh, detailing the science behind it. Kathleen Hall Jamieson, director of the Ennenberg Public Policy Center at the University of Pennsylvania, told the Washington Post that their move violated scientific norms. You don't. 
when you're a public health official, want to be saying, trust us, we know we, we, we know we can't tell you how. The scientific norm suggests that when you make a statement based on science, you show the science. And the second mistake is they do not appear to be candid about the extent to which breakthroughs are yielding hospitalizations. We have some tweets uh, from Kevin McCarthy. Democrats are basing their new mask mandate on 100 person study from India. It didn't pass peer review and uses vaccines that aren't approved in America. This is the science they're using to try and control Americans. He says total hypocrisy when President Biden tweeted about masks on May 13th. Drew Hamill says, unfortunately, we can't verify this audio because of poor quality, but I can confirm that Speaker, Speaker Pelosi believes that saying a mask requirement is not a decision based on science is moronic. Frank Thorpe tweeted Pelosi on the backlash to mask mandates, quote, that's the purview of the Capitol physician. Nothing to say except we honor it. McCarthy questions it. Pelosi says he's such a moron. We don't know if that's true, I suppose. But here we go, my friends. Broadway, New York. You will need proof of vaccination and masks. Proof of vaccination and masks. And masks, okay? We're not just going back to masks. We're going vaccine mandate and mask mandate. Bill de Blasio said he wanted to go in this direction. He was offering cash for jabs. You know, 100 bucks, I think it was. He was saying that the, to- the voluntary phase is over. Get away from the cities, man. I'll say it time and time again. I'm out here in the middle of nowhere, and I just say get away from the cities. From the Daily Mail, federal vaccine mandate, vaccine passports to go abroad, $100 bribes, and mandatory shots for the military. Biden's draconian master plan to end American tragedy of COVID. They say President Joe Biden is launching a tough new approach on the COVID pandemic. He will require federal government's 2 million workers to show proof of vaccination or submit to weekly testing. I will stress that again. If they're now reporting the Washington Post and the CDC that whether you're vaccinated or not, you can transmit the Delta variant, they need to be testing everyone and only testing the unvaccinated seems to make no sense. He wants the military to add COVID to other vaccines mandated for forces, called for incentives and mandates. He will reimburse businesses who provide leave for shots. White House is embracing new face mask guidelines from CDC. Biden also showing his frustration with those who refuse to get vaccinated. Delta variant causing COVID cases to spike around the country. Some critics say Biden should not have been so quick to lift face mask rules. Jack Posobiec tweeted. I'm sorry, Marjorie Taylor Greene, followed by a quote from Jack Posobiec. MTG says, according to a Democratic staff source, at least two Pelosi staffers tested positive for COVID this week and have been told to keep coming to work this week and remain working in speaker's office. Jack Posobiec says White House official official just confirmed this. Also hearing more staffers than just Pelosi all had contact with Texas delegation. It seems there's a good old dose of rules for thee, but not for me. Pelosi staffers reportedly have COVID, but are told to keep coming in and keep working while everyone's told to wear a mask. Well, you could argue that the mask mandate makes sense if you were telling people who are testing positive for COVID not to show up. If Nancy Pelosi is telling these people to actually come to work, then what's the point of Biden or anybody else saying you need negative COVID tests? Certainly the politicians are ignoring that if that story is true. Now, the next major crisis and is, is the eviction crisis. And I think this story shows that the lockdown is coming. Another lockdown, this time probably for longer. House Democrats scrambling to set up vote on eviction ban extension from the Hill. House Democratic leaders are scrambling to tee up a Friday vote on a bill that would extend a federal eviction ban through the end of the year with just two days before it expires. The House Rules Committee on Friday morning debated a bill from Rep. Maxine Waters to continue the CDC's eviction moratorium, which is set to lapse Sunday without congressional action. Waters, the chairwoman of the House Financial Services Committee, introduced an emergency measure on Thursday evening to extend the ban through December 31st. The rules panel which sets terms of floor debate for House legislation, is expected to advance the bill at some point on Friday, just a day after President Biden urged Congress to extend the evasion ban. Quote, I quite frankly wish he had asked us sooner, said Rep. Jim McGovern, chairman of the rules panel during a Friday morning hearing. It's my hope we can move quickly to get this bill through the House, McGovern added. Every hour is of the essence. Biden's request, issued two days before the House was set to break for the August recess, kicked off a rush to avert a potential eviction cliff. Speaker Pelosi pleaded with her caucus in, in letters in letter to the Senate, uh, letter sent late Thursday night, 
calling an extension a moral imperative. We in Congress have the opportunity and the responsibility to respect the dignity of those who have suffered so much in terms of their health, financial security, and well-being. Even so, it is unclear if Waters' bill has enough Democratic support to pass the House with what will likely be unanimous Republican opposition. If the legislation makes it through, it would then need support from at least 10 Republican senators and all 50 members of the Democratic caucus to avoid a GOP filibuster in the Senate. Republicans have excoriated the Biden administration and House Democrats for for waiting until the last moment to rush through an emergency extension despite knowing for more than a month about the impending deadline. This was a known and preventable disaster, and to call it an emergency now is absolutely patently absurd, said Rep. Patrick McHenry of North Carolina, the top Republican on the House Financial Services Committee. The CDC renewed the moratorium on June 24th through the end of July for what it said would be the last time. The Supreme Court also warned the administration on June 29th that further extensions of the CDC order must be approved by Congress, arguing the agency did not have the authority to issue the ban. Think about this. This is the government instructing private entities and businesses that they cannot charge money for the services rendered. I get it. Housing is important. But this, my friends, is going above and beyond. Now, there's a lot of things to be said about potential homelessness. There's a lot of things to be said about the landlords who also are are eating this. And they're not all ultra wealthy people. It may be a three flat where someone bought a building and they rent out two floors. It is to say, I think I think it is uh, it is important to highlight this because the extension suggests we are not going to be getting out of this anytime soon. If there was a con- belief that, the, that, that we were going to pull out of, of the crisis and the tailspin, they would certainly be easing these, these rules, the unemployment payments, and trying to get us back to normal. Instead, they're seeking to extend the moratorium until December, December 31st. There's also been conversations about extending the unemployment payments, which is to suggest they think we will have economic restrictions moving forward. There are millions of job openings, and there's a labor shortage at the same time. The problem is being caused by these lockdowns, which don't seem to be working. But I can't tell you about anything else because the news is all extremely contradictory. What I can say is that homeless camps have been popping up everywhere from the Daily Mail. D.C. homeless encampment in the shadow of Watergate stays for now. Authorities say despite furious locals complaints about drugs, harassment, human excrement and weapons. From CBS 2, L.A. City Council approves ordinance to restrict homeless encampments. Why? Because they're everywhere. We were, t- I, we were talking to somebody on the Tim Cast Arrow podcast who said they went to L.A. I think about him and Jack. And that normally, you know, Skid Row is very uh, where all the homeless people are. And they saw these homeless tents and said, whoa, were we on Skid Row? And then someone from L.A. responded, bro, Skid Row is the entire city now. Homeless camps are everywhere. We have Portland. Portland bans homeless camps in forest areas and amid wildfires. Portland stressed that the rule was to prevent fires from starting in the city. And then we have this from ABC9. Outreach groups bring relief to people and pets in homeless camps across Kansas City. It's happening everywhere. Perhaps we do need uh, a moratorium on on evictions. Congress will have to approve that, and they have about a day to get it through. In New York, I'm being told that they're going to be paying the landlords to keep the system churning. But where does this where does this leave us? Regardless of what you think can, will or is happening, the economy is in serious trouble. Inflation is getting bad. John Schnatter, Papa John's former chairman, told us that he knows people running pizza places where they got to pay 35 bucks an hour to people to make the pizzas. 35 bucks. Are we really going to be facing hyperinflation? You think a year lockdown was bad for the economy? What do you think is going to happen if we do it again, this time with exponential, with with, with an exponential return? One one year of lockdown was bad enough, a little bit longer. And now what? We're entering another one? In Australia, they've decided to bring out the military because they don't, because they said some people don't think the rules apply to them. You know, Australia doesn't have a Bill of Rights. They don't have the same rights we do in the United States. So maybe we won't see that here. If the military were to be deployed, it would be extremely serious. Now, we did see deployments during the pandemic to distribute the vaccine. But for enforcement, posse comitatus, Um, off the top of my head, my understanding is the military can't be used to enforce civilian law. But what happens if we see the invocation of National Security Presidential Directive 51? Do you know what that is? Signed in by George W. Bush, it states the president can essentially create a new constitutional government 
with a, uh, what is it, a national continuity coordinator. Now, just because George W. Bush signed this doesn't mean it can be done. It's never been tested legally. And many argue that it's probably not even legal. But right now, Joe Biden, as Trump did, as Obama did, could claim Directive 51 because of a massive loss of life, giving them martial law authorities, reshaping this country as we know it. Will they invoke Directive 51? I'd be interested to see if they do. I almost don't want to think so, but it's one way to have an end run around the Constitution, around the Bill of Rights. Directive 51 states, uh, and I'll paraphrase, that if there is a major catastrophe, you know, triggering a, ma- a major loss of life anywhere, the government can effectively be rolled over into a new constitutional government with one coordinator for all three branches of government. It would create a, a supreme seat of power for the president who decides to wield it. I warned that Trump could have done it. Many people said it wasn't possible. There have been similar directives and there's even an update, so maybe it won't. Maybe it can't happen. Maybe my information's out to date. Suffice it to say, there are numerous ways the federal government can just seize power and say we are going to be enforcing things. And to be honest, there are certain circumstances where they probably need to. I mean, if we were getting attacked by a foreign adversary, then there would be serious martial law. Only because of the luxury and comfort and wealth of this nation have we lived so truly free. Even for those that are libertarian, it's important to recognize that there have been times of war where certain rights get suspended because the fate of our nation hangs in the balance, notably with the U.S. Civil War back in the 1860s. Abraham Lincoln did a lot of really awful things, but we look back at, on him with, uh, with veneration and reverence for, for a great president. So I don't know what to tell you. Trust is out the window. And if you don't trust, then you will never accept any of these measures. Australia is doing it. I don't know. Maybe it won't happen here. We'll see. Next segment's coming up tonight at 8 p.m. over at youtube.com slash timcastirl. Thanks for hanging out, and I will see you all then.